Also vielen Dank. Ich bedanke mich ganz herzlich bei Michael Knoche für diese Einladung. Und ich fühle mich wirklich geehrt, in dieser Tagung teilzunehmen. Ich werde aber auf Englisch sprechen. Sie können schon das Thema The Future of Libraries Uh, the state of books, I'm sure you all have heard many times loose talk about the death of the book and the obsolescence of libraries. That, of course, is Wahnsinn. Uh, <laughs> books and libraries are more important than ever in the current digital environment and their importance will increase as we design the digital future if only we can get that future right. I want to develop this argument by looking backward into the history of libraries very briefly and then forward into plans to create a new kind of library, the Digital Public Library of America. Now, the historical importance of libraries must seem obvious. If you take a tour of a typical American university, you will get the point immediately. The library stands at the center of the campus and it occupies a corresponding place at the heart of the intellectual life of the university. It pumps intellectual energy into every corner of the university, including libraries, where scientists download digital information without knowing that it comes to them through the library. At Harvard, the university owes its very name to its library because in 1638 a certain John Harvard, about whom we know almost nothing, left 400 <coughs> books, his personal library, to this tiny acad academy that had been created in 1636. So suddenly this academy had the largest library in North America. 400 books, <laughs> and it changed its name to Harvard. Uh, well, since then, it, Harvard grew up around this core of learning, these 400 books, and today, 378 years and 20 million volumes later, we recognize that the university owes its greatness uh, above all to the intellectual riches built up over many generations and stored in the largest university library in the world. But I don't mean to indulge in institutional bragging. You know, we librarians sometimes do this. We say, uh, how many incunabula do you have in your library? <laughs> How many e-books do you have in yours? No, I don't want to brag about Harvard. Instead, I would like to ask a very different question. Shouldn't Harvard's library and though the holdings of other research libraries be treated as a national and in fact an international asset? Shouldn't this intellectual wealth be shared? Now, for most of history, that wealth was restricted, of course, to a privileged few. And contrary to common belief, the history of libraries does not lead ever upward in some magnificent trajectory towards progress. We're in a magnificent library now, Herr Knoche, but things were not always good. If you look at the history of libraries, there were bad points, there were down points. In fact, from what little we know about the library of Alexandria, it 
function primarily to store texts, not to make them available to readers. It admitted a few scholars, to be sure, but its main purpose probably was to uh, magnify the greatness of the Ptolemaic dynasty. And the same principle applied to Chinese attempts, as in Alexandria, to bring together all the books in the world, in the Chinese world, of course. The Qing Emperor, Qin Lung, set out to do exactly that by confiscating all the books he could from his subjects and to do that on a gigantic scale. From 1772 to 1778, he simply requisitioned books. He kept everything that glorified the Qing dynasty and he burned everything that was critical of the Qings or favorable to the Mings. So China lost a vast amount of its cultural heritage. That books between 1550 and 1750. And I could give you more and more examples. Uh, the greatest, of course, was the uh, astonishing uh, destruction of books by uh, Stalin in, uh, during the Great Terror of 1938 to 39. He got rid of 24 million books. So the history of libraries has, you could say, a darker side. But of course, to be sure, our great oldest universities represent the bright side of the history of libraries. I may need some help. Yeah, good. So while technological help arrives, um, I will explain the point I'm trying to make. Uh, these great libraries, of course, kept learning alive. Uh, I'll explain what this provocative photo is about in a minute. Uh, they kept their books, uh, preserved books from the early Middle Ages on, but they kept the books behind locked doors and thick walls, which removed them from outsiders. When I was a student at Oxford, that is me uh, up above uh, wearing an Oxford gown and I will explain, well I'll explain now. This is St. John's College. Every college in Oxford, I'm sure many of you have visited them, is surrounded by walls. Walls that are 10 to 15 feet high and on top of the walls <coughs> are spikes or shards of glass. My college, St. John's College, closed its gates at 10 o'clock in the evening. And if you were outside in the street, you were in trouble. The only way to get in was to climb over these walls. It was impossible, but there were a few passages that we knew about as students. So this is 1961. And this is one of the passages I'm posing with a friend but we had revolving spikes on the bottom and straight spikes on the top, and I had to get in between them, usually having drunk too much. <laughs> so the point I'm trying to make is the library inside the college kept its learning out from the outsiders. And here, for example, you see the university library, the Bodleian Library, there are spikes and in the background crenellations showing the public that this is private territory, the <laughs> land of learning. Uh, outsiders are kept outside, looking in to this privileged world of learning. And I can go on and on and on. 
showing you spikes, signs, stay out. The world of learning is reserved for the elite, the students at Oxford. Well, uh, that was 1961 when I was a student. Things have changed a little bit. Uh, but actually, what I want to discuss are the invisible barriers that keep outsiders outside the world of learning. So I will flash these pictures of Oxford's walls just symbolically to remind you about the exclusiveness that has dominated the history of libraries. The invisible barriers actually are very effective. Libraries frequently keep outsiders outside by all sorts of measures. Restrictive qualifications for entry, payment to obtain a reader's card, and an atmosphere of intimidation. Ordinary folk hesitate to brave these barriers. They are kept at a distance by the learned elite who wear an air of effortless superiority, which corresponds, I think, to what the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu identified as distinction. Now, of course, a counter tendency gathered force in the Age of Enlightenment when philosophers like Condorcet understood the diffusion of knowledge to be the most important force in history, one that would extend everywhere, destroying prejudice and promoting progress. That faith was shared by the founding fathers of the United States, notably the great friend of Condorcet, Thomas Jefferson, who declared, quote, the field of knowledge is the common property of mankind, end quote. As the founders understood it, the health of the Republic depended on a well-informed citizenry, and the spread of light was commensurate with the reading of books. But a few more reminders about the obstacles. Now, in retrospect, if you listen to the great pronouncements of the Founding Fathers and the philosoph of the Enlightenment, it all sounds rather utopian. But this utopian vision helped inspire the opening of libraries. Ordinary readers were allowed inside the French Royal Library in 1692, in the British Museum in 1759, and in the United States, the first large public library, the Public Library of Boston, was opened in 1848 with a great collection, and all citizens of Boston were allowed not merely to have access to the books, but to take them home. The New York Public Library opened its great collections to everyone in the city or anywhere in 1911. It served actually as an informal university for immigrants. They sometimes came right off the boats and went to the great library at 42nd Street and 5th Avenue and could read books in their native languages. So, uh, it offered instruction and access to information without even <coughs> requiring a reader's card. You just walked in from the street and got books. But this kind of knowledge, of course, depended on a limited technology, the printing press. Most people in the 18th century could not read, and those who could read could not afford to buy books. Today, we have the internet. We now have it in our power to realize what was a utopian vision in the Age of Enlightenment. As an example of what can be accomplished now, 
thanks to the internet, consider the difference between two great encyclopedias. The Encyclopédie, edited by Diderot, was the Bible of the Enlightenment, and it was, in its day, a marvel of intellectual production. That is, 250 years ago. 17 volumes of text by about 200 contributors. No one had seen anything like it. But it cost 980 livres tournois, the equivalent of two and a half years of wages by a common laborer. Wikipedia now contains 30 million articles by 77,000 active uh, contributors, as they are called, and it reaches 365 million readers free of charge. So a new ideal of openness is transforming the world of knowledge. No need to tell this to you librarians, but the dimensions are simply staggering and the possibilities are greater still. Its origins go back to the Enlightenment ideal of a republic of letters. That is, in principle, a free intellectual realm with no police force, no boundaries, no exclusiveness. But in practice, of course, only a tiny elite enjoyed citizenship in this republic during the 18th century. Today we have open universities, open source software, open metadata, open access journals, and the beginning of an open information highway. Unfortunately, however, this tendency also has a darker side because in some ways, access to knowledge is being closed. What I ask you is the cost of an average subscription to a chemical journal today. Some of you as librarians maybe know the answer. In the US, it is $4,044 a year. What was it in 1970? $33 a year. Inflation accounts for only a small part of the increase. During the last 25 years, the price of academic periodicals went up at four times the inflation rate, according to the Consumer Price Index. One year's subscription to the Journal of Comparative Neurology, you may not all be readers of the Journal of Comparative Neurology, I don't know how many readers it has, maybe 10, um, it costs $30,860 for one year's subscription. That's the equivalent of 600 monographs. In 2014, Elsevier turned a 39% profit on an income of 2.1 billion, billion pounds sterling only from its science, technology, and medical journals. Three giant publishers, Reed Elsevier, Wiley Blackwell, and Springer, now publish 42% of all academic articles, and these giant publishers make giant profits from them. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not claiming that this ruinous increase in the price of periodicals can be explained by sheer greed on the part of publishers. They are doing their job. They are returning the largest possible profit to their shareholders. Perhaps they should be congratulated for doing it so well. But their success should, I think, give us pause because it illustrates the negative counterpart to the trend toward openness that I was just celebrating, namely commercialization, a trend toward closing access to knowledge. The output of articles in medical science doubles 
every two to three years. So yes, more knowledge is constantly being produced, but an increasingly small percentage of it is available to the public. Why? No need to tell you librarians. Libraries simply cannot afford the increase in the prices. The average price for a medical journal was $12 in 1970. It is now $1,470. All over the United States, libraries are canceling subscriptions to academic journals because they are caught between decreasing budgets and increasing costs. The logic of the bottom line is inescapable. But there is a higher logic that deserves consideration, namely that the public should have access to knowledge produced with public funds. A brief um, parenthesis about U.S. politics, but I believe you have politics in Germany as well. <laughs> Congress acted on this principle. The public should have access to research financed by public funds. Congress acted on the principle when it required that articles based on grants from the National Institutes of Health be made available from an open access repository called PubMed Central, which you probably know. But lobbyists from the publishers, especially Elsevier, blunted that requirement by getting the NIH to accept a 12-month embargo to prevent public accessibility long enough for the publishers to cream off the demand. Uh, I could offer more details about the publishers' lobbies at work in Washington. Those lobbies are still at work trying to block something we call the Fair Access to Science and Technology Act, FASTER it's called, that would give the public free access to the publication of all research funded by all federal agencies with budgets of over $100 million. But will this act make it through Congress? Not likely. The lobbyists are too powerful and the politicians are, I think, beholden to the lobbyists. Now the battle over journal prices illustrates a conflict between two tendencies that I think will determine the digital future democratization versus commercialization. Now, of course, I don't mean to reduce a complex situation to a simplistic formula. We have to find a way in a real world of wealth and power to find an equitable balance between private interests and the public good. We therefore face a fundamental question. Have we got the balance right in the world of books and libraries? Consider Google. In 2004, Google set out to digitize the collections of our greatest research libraries. It intended to use the data in a search service, a search service, which would make snippets or small passages from the books available for users seeking information about a specific subject. So you would see snippets on your screen. And in some cases, Google even uh, made available information about where you, the user, could find that book in a nearby library. We thought it was great. And Google, of course, came first to Harvard and said, we will digitize all of your books free. Of course, we had been paying for these books since 1638, and they represented a tremendous amount of wealth and learning. But we said, yes, go to it. And then Google said, by the way, we want to digitize books covered by copyright as well. We then said, no, that would be an infringement of the law. But Google then went 
to Michigan, to Stanford, to the universities of California, they all said yes, and soon Google was digitizing books on an enormous scale, books which were covered by copyright. It was instantly sued, of course, by the Authors Guild and the Association of American Publishers, and then Google and the plaintiffs went into secret negotiations for three and a half years. Uh, I was actually allowed to sit in on some of these negotiations because Google wanted Harvard to approve of the result, but we withdrew from them after a while because it didn't smell good. <laughs> the result was something called the settlement, and the settlement actually created what transformed what had originally been a search service into a commercial library. So we, the libraries, were being asked to buy back access to our own books in digital form at a price to be set by Google and a price that could escalate out of control exactly as the price of periodicals had done. It did not seem like a good idea, at least to me, and we had polemics in the press, in the New York Review of Books, uh, there was a debate, an important debate about this question, and then it went to the court, where a federal court in the Southern District of New York declared Google book search is a violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. It's illegal, it will not exist, and in fact, it's dead. What was Google trying to do? Well, Google was trying to create a monopoly of a new kind, a monopoly of access to knowledge in digital form. It would have privatized a vast stretch of the public domain and collected a toll from anyone who tried to enter its fenced-off territory. It was an audacious and in some ways an exhilarating a project and it raised the prospect of finding a democratic alternative to a commercial speculation. In the era of print, this open access tradition in the US anyhow goes back to the founding of the public Boston Public Library in 1848 carved over the entrance to the, the main door is uh, a, the motto, really, of the Boston Public Library, free to all. Now that we have entered the digital age, we can do better. We can make all of the material in all of our research libraries available to everyone free of charge, and that is the basic idea behind the Digital Public Library of America. On October 1st, 2010, long before Google Book Search was rejected by the court, a, a group of leaders from foundations, libraries, and internet technology met at Harvard to discuss the possibility of creating this Digital Public Library of America, or DPLA, as we call it. The foundations would combine forces to provide the funds. The libraries would cooperate to furnish the books. We created a steering committee, a secretariat with a small staff, and work groups scattered across the country. We had meetings. And at the meetings, I don't know if this happens in Germany, here today, you would have an artist with a, a, a blackboard or a whiteboard drawing figures that illustrated suggestions that you would make in the audience. So here is one of the artists we hired, and as we discussed the possibilities for the DPLA, the artist is improvising pictures. 
and this is the kind of thing that would appear, it gives you a sense of the public debate about what the DPLA should be. We had meetings, large meetings, open to everyone in San Francisco, in Chicago, in Washington, D.C. And of course, most of the discussion took place through the internet. There was email, listservs, websites, wikis, and blogs. There was streaming and texting and tweeting, a running debate about every aspect of the plans in which everyone had a chance to be heard. At the same time, there was enough coordination from the Berkman Center at Harvard for the DPLA to be launched successfully online on April 18th, 2013. Now that the DPLA has celebrated its third anniversary, uh, congratulations again on your birthday, Mikhail, but we are three years old in the DPLA. Uh, its collections include nearly 12 million books and other objects, five times the amount that it had when it first went online. These come from nearly 2,000 institutions, and they are located in all 50 states of the Union. They're also being widely used. Millions of visitors have consulted the DPLA's website, dp.la, you're all welcome to do it, and they come from every country in the world, except three, North Korea, Chad and Western Sahara. The DPLA's collections include material in 500 languages. This is the website. It changes from time to time, but it gives you a good idea. Uh, of course, by consulting the website, dp.la, you can call up the texts of books but you can do much more. You can browse through all the collections by place and by time period. You can wander through virtual exhibitions. Uh, they are especially popular, we have found, in secondary schools where they are used as teaching techniques. And of course, you can make use of all kinds of apps, which are constantly being grafted onto the system by independent innovators. These are just people who have good ideas, invent a tool, and have it grafted onto the central system. How should you envisage the DPLA? Not as a grand edifice with an imposing dome erected over a gigantic database. No, it is a distributed system. That is a horizontal network that links up digital connection collections in libraries, archives, and museums in such a manner that uh, users can get access to a document with one click on an electronic device. The DPLA is now incorporated as a nonprofit enterprise. It has headquarters with a small staff in Boston, but it's not a top-down organization. Its horizontality corresponds to its democratic spirit and its basic goal, namely, to make the cultural heritage of America available, free of charge, to all Americans and to everyone in the world. Far from intending to serve an exclusive audience, such as the elite who have access to university libraries, the DPLA is designed to meet the needs of many different publics, students of all ages, seniors in homes for the elderly, researchers without institutional affiliation, 
readers of all kind, including those who merely want to deepen their enjoyment of literature. It is organized in what we call hubs that extend its services like the spokes of a wheel. Content hubs such as Harvard, the Smithsonian Institution, and the New York Public Library provide digitized material from their enormous collections. Service hubs aggregate other collections and develop networks at the state level. So far, they exist in 25 states, and soon we expect that they will be active in all 50 states of the Union. The service hubs make special efforts to reach people in small communities, working with local public libraries, whether in small towns or urban neighborhoods. The libraries invite everyone in a town or a neighborhood to bring in diaries, letters, photograph albums, and other items stored in attics or trunks. The material is digitized, supplied with metadata, curated, and preserved. In this way, communities sharpen their awareness of their own culture and history, and at the same time, their local collections are integrated in a national network, which grows organically day by day. Now, of course, the DPLA cannot reach every town in the United States. It relies on volunteers, including a small army of community reps, as we call them, these are usually librarians who go out to towns and help organize them to digitize their local resources. There are now 600 community reps scattered through all 50 states, and the DPLA is also developing a program to train librarians in public libraries to acquire the special skills that will be needed to launch digital projects in their communities. So here is an example of, of material available to users who are interested in the small town life in a fairly remote state, Minnesota, or who may be interested in agriculture and agronomy. You click onto places and you can have access to special collections about towns and farming. Many of these services are aimed at schools. The DPLA recently formed a partnership with the public broadcasting system to provide specially designed and curated materials to teachers and students. It also uh, makes available 100 course sets, as we call them. Those are collections of primary source materials for use in the classroom. And these have been adopted everywhere in the country. In another third new program, uh, it was announced by President Obama on April 30th last year. It is, the DPLA is cooperating with publishing houses to provide free ebooks, copyrighted ebooks, to children in low income families. So the DPLA has developed an important pedagogical mission. Now, of course, all of these programs, and we develop new programs almost every month, depend on the most advanced technology. I won't try to describe the DPLA's technological infrastructure, but I should emphasize that it, too, was a volunteer effort developed on a national scale. Uh, after we first founded the idea for the DPLA, we announced a competition. We called it a beta sprint, and computer scientists all over the country were invited to send in suggestions for the organization of the DPLA. Um, more than, uh, it was, I think, 1,100 computer scientists sent in suggestions. 
free. They weren't paid anything. We had a blue ribbon committee select the best, and then we went through several iterations perfecting what finally became the infrastructure of the DPLA, which functioned flawlessly when the DPLA was launched. This infrastructure is compatible with Europeana, which, as you know, is the system to integrate digital collections within the European Union. And it has special appeal, I think, because of its API, or Application Programming Interface. Uh, this is just a schematic version, but the top bar of these three gold bars represents the API, which is built into its structure and has turned out to be much more popular than we ever imagined. We've been surprised at its enormous use. Uh, it gets three million hits per month uh, already last year, and uh, it provides a way for anyone to develop a particular tool or collection, which then can be used by everyone else connected to the system. Um, so we have innovative apps that are being produced by independently by users all the time. My favorite is called Bookshelf. It creates the possibility of digital browsing. So what you see are titles of books. They're represented vertically, but turn them around and pretend it's a bookshelf. So you are interested on, in a particular book, but then the system arranges for books on related subjects to appear on your screen, and they can be extended indefinitely. So you can then click on the spine of one of the related books consult its table of contents, do word searches, and browse the way you could browse in a physical library. It's been very popular. Um, you could do lots of other things. Uh, here are examples of other apps developed independently by DPLA users. This is a visual montage of guitars. This one is a series of maps of Chicago which make it possible to study urban space on a macro or a micro level. Um, in these and other outreach projects, the DPLA hopes to engage with its readers. Instead of simply making its content available and waiting for them to step up and use it, it seeks to interact with them and to enlist them in shaping its growth. Now, of course, we face plenty of problems. Having depended on support from foundations from the beginning, we need to develop a long-term business plan. The technology requires constant maintenance and improvement, and as the DPLA increases in size and scope, it must resolve issues of governance and administration. So you may have plenty of questions which I will attempt to answer. But the biggest problem of all, strange as it may seem, uh, is legal. The DPLA must respect copyright, but copyright now covers books for the life of the author plus 70 years, that is, in most cases, for more than a century. What was it at the time of the original copyright law in the US? The law of 1790? 14 years, renewable once. So we've gone from 28 years to far more than 100 years in keeping books out of the public domain. And I think this is terrible. Most literature from the 20th century is therefore excluded from the DPLA's collection. And by that, I mean every book since 1964 and nearly every book since 1923. Some recent uh, court decisions, however, open up 
a, at least a glimmer of hope because, as you probably know, in the U.S. we have something called fair use based on the Copyright Act of 1976. So you have cases in courts, there was one last week, which are expanding the concept of fair use, making it at least hopeful that more and more of this copyrighted literature can be made available to users. Another possibility is an extended collective licensing agreement on the Norwegian model. But unfortunately, that would require legislation, and we have no copinor as Norway does. For the moment, therefore, the DPLA is hoping that authors will voluntarily turn over the use of their copyrights after the commercial viability of their books has been exhausted. Authors in general derive very little income from a book a year or two after its publication. Once its commercial life has ended, it dies a slow death lying unread, except for rare occasions on the shelves of a few libraries, inaccessible to the vast majority of readers. At that stage, authors generally have one dominant desire for their work to circulate freely through the public. They want to have readers, and their interest coincides with the open access movement. So we have created another new organization called the Authors Alliance. It was um, launched recently as a campaign to persuade authors to make their books available online at some point after publication through the DPLA and a Creative Commons license. So far, the response is encouraging. It may sound naive, but I think it is possible for the DPLA to satisfy authors and readers alike by bringing them together digitally. Despite the pressure of commercialization, therefore, the DPLA has tapped a vein of, well, public spirit that is both idealistic and pragmatic. It draws inspiration from the Age of Enlightenment, but it is designed to serve the needs of the 21st century. And at a time of disgust at the dysfunction of Washington, D.C., it is proved that it can get things done by independent initiative. You should not think of it as a digital version of the Library of Congress. It's a new kind of library altogether, not just in its technology, but in its organization and spirit. It will operate simultaneously on many levels, personal, local, national, and international. It is already functioning successfully, and it will continue to acquire new functions with ever-expanding collections for many generations. Of course, the technology will also continue to change, and the DPLA will have to change with the technology far into the future. But if we can get things right now, we can help shape that future. For the first time in history, we can make the cultural heritage of humanity available to all humans. We have the technology, the know-how, the resources, and the will. We have taken the first steps, and now we have to get the job done. Thank you.